wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ is my King. What a wonderful name it is. Not to confess to this. What a wonderful name it is. Oh, oh, oh. 
coming screaming from the mountains Go on and fell into the masses That he is God Amber, awesome. All right, cool. So, uh, as Katie already mentioned, next week we're going to be doing the, uh, you know, I've already kind of given the vision for the church as a whole. We're actually going to be wanting the parents to come in around 9.30, which I know is a little tough as parents, uh, but around 9.30, which is during the normal fellowship time that we have here, and to, to sit down with myself and Kevin and the other people running the children's ministry just so you guys get a good idea of what our vision for the children's ministry is, because it is a little different. It is a little unique. 
compared to other churches, but like I said, it is a work in progress. We're developing it in accordance with the needs of the people who are here. So I, I do firmly believe that the kids' ministry is actually the most important ministry that we're going to develop here. Um, it is important that the church is equipped for the work of the saints, that we go out and we're able to share our faith and be strengthened in our faith in the way that we live our lives unto God. But it's equally important that the kids that are a part of the fellowship are raised in that. Right? I think it's very sad that a lot of people raised in the church don't stay. So uh, we're trying to address that as best as we can in this fellowship. So if you have an interest in the kids' ministry or, if, like I said, you are a parent and you have kids that are a part of this church, please attend, and uh, we'll be able to do that next Sunday. But for today, we're actually going to go through the book of Ruth. So I finished my first kind of series on, <clears throat> uh, bless you, on uh, just the vision of the church and how that's going to look here. But now we're going to kind of get into the normal studies, and I was going to get into Genesis today, but, you know, I just, I really love holidays. And so I thought it would be good to do a Halloween service on Ruth, which may sound weird to you, but I'll explain why Ruth has a lot to do with Halloween, actually. Um, so most people don't know this, but the original name of Halloween was All Hallows Eve. The word hallow is actually an old-fashioned word that means to make something sacred or holy, and it actually is the root word for the word that we call today saint, right? So if you ever heard of someone being a saint, it may have been corrupted a little bit. We'll talk, we'll talk more about that in a second. That, that phrase has been corrupted in our modern parlance, but literally all saint means is somebody who's been set apart by God. In other words, a saint is someone who has an active relationship with the Lord, someone who has been called out from the world and has been brought into the kingdom of God and now has an active relationship with him. So it may sound weird for you to say it, but you are, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today you're a saint. I don't know if you knew that, but now you do, right? And so we used to have in the church a celebration that we called All Saints. Day. And before that day, we had All Hallows Eve. So just October 31st was All Hallows Eve. November 1st was All Saints Day. And what that day was, is it was a celebration of the people who came before us in the faith. People who we look up to, heroes of the faith, or even like family members that you could talk about that introduced your family to a relationship with God. But over the years, like I said, this day became a little bit corrupted when the concept of saints became more about a veneration as opposed to an appreciation. So this is just what human beings do. We have fallen and corruptible hearts, and we want to worship men. We want to worship the things of men. And so over time, what the church started to do is they started to quasi-worship the saints that came before. And there was really strict parameters about what it meant to be a saint and what it meant not to be a saint. And it was no longer a term that referred to those who were being set apart by God. And it started to become like a, a almost like a superhero term. You know, like you, normal Christians weren't saints. You had to be like Saint Christopher. You had to be like Saint, you had to be this, this incredibly holy person in order to be considered a saint. And that also took on connotations of praying to the saints, interceding for the saints, and all that jazz. And so when Martin Luther, and the reformers in the church actually started to rebel. That's why it's called the Protestant movement. They were protesting Rome. They picked as the day to rebel against Rome, October 31st. Why? Because one of the things that they had beef with was All Saints Day, right? The, what, what they were doing to the saints. And they wanted to resist that. Now, they made a mistake, though, I believe. You know, far be it for me to, to question them. But... I believe one of the mistakes they made is they started becoming overly critical of everything that the Catholic Church was doing, and they started to excise a lot of these good practices instead of trying to reform them, which is what their movement was supposed to be about. And because of that, you had this really amazing day that was widely vacated by the Protestant movement, and America is a widely Protestant nation. And so we had this day that we celebrated, but everybody forgot why we were celebrating it. And Jesus tells a really interesting parable in the Gospel of Luke. 
he talks about a man who is saved. He says that someone, he has a demon in him, and the demon is cast out and it goes into the wilderness and the dry places. And the man basically says, like, okay, I'm good to go. And the demon gets with seven other demons and says, hey, this guy's house is all cleaned up. Let's go back in. And they now he has seven demons living in him. And Jesus says, and the latter state was worse than the first. Now, what Jesus means is that once God comes in and does a work on a person or a nation or anything like that, if that work stops at simply being cleansed, you're actually open to a worse type of folly than what came before it. So if you look around, you say, I get what you're saying, Peter, but when I think of Halloween, I don't think of All Hallows' Eve. I don't think about All Saints' Day. I think about death and demonic connotations, and I think about really sick and dark things. Well, the reason why you think that way is because the church vacated a day and they left it open to corruption. And that's what happened. And if you look around our culture, and you see the culture becoming darker and darker and more and more corrupt, remember, all of the institutions that we now have a problem with today were formed by Christians. When the church leaves something, the worse the state will be worse than it was before we came into it, right? So it's actually a lie. Don't let anyone tell you that Halloween was originally a pagan holiday called Samhain. It wasn't, right? The church invented this holiday, right? And now we've allowed it to go back to paganism. So why does Ruth have anything to do with All Saints Day? Well, Ruth is a really fascinating book. I love the book of Ruth. I've read it like three or four times this week because it's just, it's very short and it's just amazing, right? If you're a sucker for a good chick flick, You'll love the Book of Ruth. Man, it is, it is like the OG chick flick. And what it is, is it's actually, and it's so sweet when you understand this, it's a story that King David and his family kept and perpetuated, right? They told each other this story because Ruth was David's great, great grandma. So it was kind of like as a family, if you're like, man, like, why are we here? Like a kid asking their parents, like, how did you meet mom? You know, and then you, you back that up a little bit. Well, how did grandma be grandpa? And then how did great grandma meet great grandpa? That's how this story was. It was the story of David's family and one of their faithful ancestors. And they kept this story and they kept telling it to their kids as a way to commemorate the faithfulness of Ruth and Boaz. And so in a way, it's a precursor to what we would today call All Saints Day. It was a time where families would gather together And they would tell the story. So what started as David's story, when David became king, became a national story, right? Because David became like almost like one of the founding fathers in America. He became a very important figure. And so people started passing around the story of Ruth and Boaz. And it was a testament to beautiful faithfulness within God. Now, the reason why that's so important, especially we're talking about kids' ministry a little bit, I mentioned this a little bit last week. What primarily informs us is not what we know intellectually, but it's what we know intuitively. So it's not what we know practically. It's our imaginations, right? It's the things that we think about the things around us. We can only perceive so much with our five senses. The vast majority of stuff that you know actually comes from your imagination. And your imagination collaborates with reality. That's what it's supposed to do. Your intellect is shaped through teaching. Your imagination is shaped through stories. Your intellect is shaped through teaching. Your your imagination is shaped through stories. So therefore, and this comes from a movie that I actually kind of liked. It it came out this year. uh, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. I I thought it was a pretty fantastic movie. I just liked the series. And in it, someone says, and it's like this super hardcore scene, and he's like, Whoever controls the narrative controls the truth, you know, and they're trying to get the entity because, you know, then they can control the narrative. And he's right, right? That is a true statement. Whoever controls the narrative controls not the truth. I would disagree with that statement, but they control the imagination. And when you control the imagination, you actually do control the truth. You control the way that people think about the truth, which is way more powerful. To lose stories 
is to lose the imagination of the culture. So the church, I think, in the last couple of years, there's been a heavy emphasis on apologetics, and I like apologetics. I study a lot of apologetics. I understand a lot about different faiths and why I don't believe in them, and why I specifically believe in Christianity. I really do like that field of study. However, you have to understand that intellect is not going to protect you from stories, from your imagination. In fact, you tend to align what you think about truth more to your imagination than you do to your intellect. It's called confirmation bias, and we all do it. And so, wouldn't it be great if we as a church emphasized stories as opposed to mere truth. Now again, those stories are supposed to collaborate with the truth, but the stories are just as important. They're very, very vital. And the story of Ruth is beautiful. Not only is the story of Ruth, I said it was kind of the original chick flick. It is, believe it or not, the inspiration for every romantic story that exists in the West. Now, some are more obvious than others. If you read the Book of Ruth, read the Book of Ruth and then read Pride and Prejudice. They are almost an identical story. They are very, very similar to one another. But even fairy tales, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, Beauty and the Beast, all these stories are in some way, you could tell that they pulled inspiration from the Book of Ruth. Now, the reason why that's the case, it's not just, it doesn't just so happen to be, it's because in the West, people were educated through the Bible. People learned how to read through the Bible. The first stories that they read were biblical stories. So all the people that have written the modern romantic comedies and things like that, they were inspired from the Bible. They read the Book of Ruth. They're like, wow, what a beautiful story. And then they started making their own stories off of that one. But it becomes more and more derivative over time, right? So Jane Austen based her novel on the Book of Ruth. But then modern people are basing it off of Jane Austen, and then more modern people are basing it off of like Nicholas Sparks or whoever, and it becomes more and more degraded over time. But the original story is Ruth. So what is the story about? It, again, it's an amazing story. I just really encourage you to read it. We're obviously not going to read it today. I'm going to pull out specific passages from it to give you a good idea of what it is. But let me give you the overview, the cliff notes. What happens in the book of Ruth? Well, in the beginning of the book, it takes place historically at the time of what we call the time of the judges, right? So this is when Israel has come into the land after the Exodus, and they've set up, but they don't have a monarchy yet. They haven't established a kingdom yet. They're more of like a confederacy at this point, and they're really disorganized. And during that time, it says in the beginning of this book, there was a famine. And in the famine, this guy, Elimelech, and his wife, Naomi, leave Israel, to go to be in Moab, which was a neighboring tribe, to, in order to survive, basically. While they're there, their sons, their two sons, marry two women. Over time, hard times hit the family. The dad dies. The brothers die. Because what does all great fairy stories begin with? Tragedy, right? Everyone dies in the beginning of a fairy story. And then you have a massive tragedy. And then they have to go back to Israel. And Naomi basically tells her daughters-in-law, like, you guys don't have any kids. You don't have any prospects. If you go with me to Israel, I have no more sons to give you. You should just stay in Moab. You'd be way better off. But Ruth says no. One of these daughter-in-laws, this, this woman who has been a pagan Moabite her whole life, is introduced to the true and living God, not through the intellect of Naomi or anything like that, but through her simple pure character. And Ruth is so enamored by the God of Israel that she voluntarily moves to Israel with Naomi and serves her. And one of the ways that she serves her, she goes out to a field to collect wheat. And while she's there, she meets a guy, the guy who owns the field is named Boaz. And Boaz is just immediately taken by Ruth, not just her beauty, but her virtue. He hears about her story and he just thinks that she's the coolest girl ever. And so he starts providing for her and protecting her in a really cool and beautiful way. And they start this little romance. And Naomi tells Ruth at one point, there was really interesting land laws in Israel. And basically land was passed down only through the male line in Israel. It was not passed down through the female line. And so Naomi realizes something. She realizes 
that because all of her sons are dead and because her husband is dead, the land that they own after she dies will go away and Ruth won't have anything. She won't have an inheritance. And so Naomi tells her, this guy Boaz is related to me. And so if you marry him, he could buy your land from you and then he could propagate it to your children. That's something you can do. He's your kinsman redeemer. We'll talk more about that later on. And so Naomi proposes to Boaz in a really cool way and a really funny way. And they end up getting married and they start having kids. And that's the end of the story. It's just like this really beautiful, simple, romantic story that we have inside of our Bible. Now, I want to just pull out a couple interesting elements of the story to help us conceptualize what this story teaches us about our imaginations concerning what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, and what it means to be in love. Those are all elements, right? What it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, and what it means to be in love are all elements that are not taught to you through school. They're not taught to you intellectually. Your imagination is responsible for all of those things. So as I talk about this story, I'm going to compare it to what our culture teaches us about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, and what it means to be in love. So the first thing, what it means to be a woman. Let's start with feminine, <laughs> femininity, because Ro Ruth is obviously a woman. Right? So in, if you have your Bibles, you could flip them up into this. Aaron's going to put them up on the screen. If you don't have your Bibles, it's totally okay. I'm going to be a really disgusting millennial right now and read from my phone because I don't have a music stand and I can't prop up my Bible correctly, so don't judge me too harshly. Um, Ruth 1 verse 15 says this, and she, that being Ruth, and by the way, this is the moment where Naomi is telling Ruth to go back to Moab. And Ruth responds to her. She says, look, your sister-in-law has gone back. I'm sorry, this is Naomi speaking. Your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and I. And it's just like, it's poetry, right? It's such a beautiful section. Now, another kind of caveat before I break down that verse a little bit more. The beautiful thing about the Bible is it doesn't just have theology. I've read a lot of religious texts, by the way. I've read the Quran. I've read the Book of Mormon. I've read uh, various other texts. A lot of them are dry and dull. They're just really hard to get through. What I love about the Bible is this is just beautiful. It's just a really beautiful book. And each book has its own unique elements of beauty. And in this story, what you see is you see that the Jews have given us not just their thoughts, but they've given us their art. We could study their art, and you could learn way more about a culture studying their arts than you can studying their intellectuals. Now, what do we learn about what the ancient Jews thought about femininity? So if you go and watch a modern female superhero movie, which, by the way, most fairy tale princess movies have turned into modern superhero female <laughs> stories, what you see, and this is something that our culture has done, and I've, I've read most of the early feminists to understand how this happened, but with women like Mary Wollstonecraft, who was the first feminist in our, she lived in like the late 1700s, what you see is that the feminists got this idea that the only character qualities that mattered were masculine. And so if you were to ask a feminine, a feminist, what does it mean to be a strong woman? They would take all the qualities usually associated with men and say a strong woman is a woman who does that. And that's why the modern superhero female movies are bombing at the box office. Because there's something in us that doesn't like that. When you take a woman and you essentially just turn her into a man and have her present femininity as just a weaker version of masculinity, it feels like a watered down male superhero movie and no one wants to watch it. The only exception to that rule was a movie that I kind of liked, Wonder Woman. I did like Wonder Woman, it was a good movie. 
But what made the movie good is that Diana, the, the main character, she actually was feminine. She had feminine qualities to her. She was vulnerable. She had interesting uh, issues inside of her emotionally that she was trying to cope with. And the, the, the movie actually circulated around her romance to Steve Trevor, right? A man. Most modern female movies won't do that. In fact, I talked about this a little bit last week, they actually are appalled by that idea that a woman would base her decisions around getting a man. How backwards and patriarchal is that? You know, I just rewatched The Little Mermaid yesterday with my daughter because they're all sick. They're all sick, and we got to just watch something. And the new Little Mermaid movie, I like so many things about it, but what I really hate about it is the fact that she is not on land to pursue Eric. She is on land because she simply wants to be a part of the human world. And Ursula takes away her memory that she has to kiss him. So her whole story is not, I'm pursuing a man, it's I'm pursuing autonomy from my dad. That's the modern feminist story. But look at Ruth. What makes Ruth strong? What makes us look at Ruth and say, that is an awesome lady. I want to be like her. It's not that she's beating up guys. She's not getting like an awesome corporate job and making six figures. What makes Ruth amazing? She is loyal and faithful. Now we used to think of those things, those qualities as being feminine strengths. That women are loyal. They are, they are dedicated to the people that they love. And you can see it even with kids. My daughter is three years old. She loves her baby brother. She wants to play with him all the time. She wants to hold his hand. And you know what he wants to do? Get away from her. Because little boys are not loyal. Little boys are out to get what they want. They're out to play. They're out to destroy things. But little girls, they want, they're social creatures. They want to be around other people. They are loyal and they are faithful. And if you want to make my daughter cry, all you got to do is be disappointed with her. You want to make my son cry? Being disappointed with him ain't going to do it. You got to just take away something that he likes and then he'll cry. It was always understood that women are preternaturally better than men at loyalty, fidelity, and affection. And that is what Ruth has. She is willing to leave everything she has ever known simply because she loved Naomi. That's it. And when you read that story, the reason why it affects you emotionally is because you realize this is beautiful. What she's doing is beautiful. This is what makes her strong, is her loyalty to her mother-in-law. Now, throughout the story, her loyalty is shown over and over and over again at the way that she sacrifices for Naomi. In fact, the only reason why she's attracted, why she agrees to marry Boaz, is not because she thinks that he's the hottest guy. He's cool, but that's not why she decides to do it. She decides to do it because she has loyalty to Naomi. She realizes this is how we get our land back. And again, that's a very attractive and appealing quality that Ruth has. There is something so beautiful about the fact that women have that loyalty. They have that just in them innately. There's a reason why Jesus came to the earth through his mother. There's a reason why we call her the mother of God. There's a reason why, when you look at even today, the rates of fatherlessness are so high and the rates of motherlessness are very low. It's because women are loyal to their children. Men need to have that taught to them through the feminine. Men are not naturally like that. We used to call it the eternal feminine. This beautiful, beautiful quality that men don't have innately, but can be taught to them throughout exposure to the feminine. This always reminds me of my favorite fairy tale, which is Beauty and the Beast. I love Beauty and the Beast. And in it, you see that Beast, the reason why Beast is a beastly guy, is because he sees all of his staff as things. That's why in the curse, they're all things, right? They're all just like walking, talking furniture pieces. It's showing that men naturally see other people as objects to be used for their purposes. And it's his exposure to Belle, it's his exposure to the feminine that teaches him that's not right. And when she loves him back, all of them turn into humans. 
along with him losing his beastly appearance. We used to know that as a culture. We used to know that men need women in order to learn loyalty, affection, and love. But we've forgotten that. Now, what does it mean to be a man? Ruth 2, verse 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, so again, this is when Ruth is hanging out with the other slaves and she's hanging out in the field, she's collecting grain. And Boaz says to her, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they have reaped and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? Now, this is a scene that would never, ever, 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 ever make it into Hollywood today. What is happening is Ruth is in a vulnerable position where she cannot protect or provide for herself. And Boaz comes in and he offers her protection and provision. And she responds by falling at his feet and thanking him. Now, back in the day, we used to call this chivalry. We used to call it chivalry, and it used to be a good thing. Now, there's a reason why chivalry is dead. And it's dead because the modern feminists have killed it. They have crucified it. In the original kind of feminist text, uh, Vindication of the Rights of Women, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft makes the argument that any man who opens a door for a woman is in derision of her. So if you ever wonder, like, when, you know, why don't men learn how to open the door for a woman anymore? It's because they've been told not to. They've literally been told not to. A woman can hold her own door open. She doesn't need you. A woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. That was what, what Simone de Beauvoir said, another feminist. Right? What they mean I'm sorry, that's Betty Fernand, in case anyone's going to fact check me. Um, but anyway, what they, what they mean by that is a woman doesn't need a man. Masculinity is a dead art. In fact, the only type of masculinity that is out there is toxic masculinity. Anyone looking at this story today would be like, Boaz, how presumptuous of you. You're just going to go there and offer her protection. What makes you think she can't take care of herself? And you're just imposing on her your fields and you're telling her not to go to another field? You're restricting her to your... Oh my gosh. You patriarchal Neanderthal. Don't you know that women can do it all? Like, what is wrong with you, Boaz? And weirdly, <clears throat> when men are taught that message, what you get is you get the worst of both worlds. Men become overly feminized and they don't know how to exercise their strength. And the men who do know how to exercise their strength become legitimately toxic. So in other words, if men are told over and over and over again, your strength is not needed, there's nothing special about you, you have nothing to offer the world, and in fact, if you try to be a man in this world, you are going to be mocked and spat upon and rejected. If that message sinks down into young men's hearts, what they learn is the only way for me to be a useful member of society is to purge myself of my natural masculinity. Or they can respond in kind, and many men are doing this nowadays. They're actually, they're sick and tired of hearing that they're useless, and so they are attracting to overly masculine, toxic individuals that are pulling them into a lifestyle of genuine oppression of women. Right? There's a reason why these men like Andrew Tate are gaining so much popularity nowadays. It's because the narrative of masculinity has been ripped away from us and they're able to create their own false paradigm. And men, young men are flocking towards it because they're finally hearing from someone being strong is not bad. But they're not becoming chivalrous. They're not becoming kind. They're not being, becoming gentle or generous. They're becoming oppressive. And the reason why is because they haven't been taught what genuine masculinity is. What does Boaz do? He recognizes his strengths and he offers to use them, get this, in service to the vulnerable. That's what chivalry is. 
recognizing that I have strength, but that strength was given to me in order to be of service to the vulnerable. Now, there was a a good time where I think we had a bit of a renaissance in America during the Marvel age. That age is kind of dead, to be honest. Uh, now, Now they're just obsessed with making more and more diversity hires within that organization. But originally, there was this idea in the original Marvel movies that you had these strong men like Tony Stark who were womanizers and stupid and oppressive and toxic, and they started to recognize I'm not strong for myself, I'm strong for others. And they used their strength and service to other people, and they became men. And it was a very, very beautiful thing. The first couple movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe were all about that. Men becoming men under the service of others. And I really liked it. I liked being an 18-year-old in that time frame and, and seeing these stories being perpetuated. But again, that time has kind of fallen off the rails, unfortunately. But if we want young men to grow up to be men of God, to be able to be created, we'll talk a little bit more about his attraction to her in a second. But Boaz sees Ruth's behavior here as a good thing. He sees it as a good thing. This is just a touchy subject today. What does it mean for a woman to be submissive to her husband? Now, this has been abused. There are abusive ways to take this. To say that, like, well, what it means for a woman to be submissive to her husband is to always ask his permission before she does anything, and his word goes, no matter what it is. It's actually not what submission is. Submission is a recognition of a hierarchy. That's what it is. Now, the perfect way to understand this is to look at God himself. So in God's nature, you have a triune deity in which the Son openly says, He submits to the Father. Now, does that mean that the Son is lesser than the Father? Well, no. Does that mean that the Son knows less than the Father? No. What does it mean? It means that the Son takes up a posture of humility and submissiveness before the Father. That's what it means. And that's what this is. A wife is to take up a posture of submissiveness and humility to the husband. Doesn't mean she can't call him out when he's wrong. There are actually women in the Bible that are praised for calling out their husbands. But what it means is that she is supposed to do it in a respectful way, in a way that acknowledges the leadership and the headship of the man. That's what's being spoken of here. And that's what she's doing. Because the father is great because he is perfect. Men are not great because they're not perfect. So submission is important, but ultimate submission is only to be given to God because only God is incapable of error. Because your husband is capable of error, you're not supposed to unconditionally submit to him. You're only to submit to Christ in him, but always, even when you disagree, and maybe especially when you disagree, you give that disagreement in respect to who he is. Now this is... There's an interesting proverb that says, a, a foolish woman tears her house down brick by brick. Because women are naturally more loyal than men, a woman has the capacity, through her loyalty and her love, to build up or to tear down the character of those that she is with. If a woman, and I, I do a lot of marriage counseling, so I'll tell you, and I always tell women this, I'll say, do you want to be right or do you want your husband to be a man? Because oftentimes when I'm counseling, ladies, women's intuition is a real thing. About 70% of the time that I've been counseling, I will see when a woman and man disagree, 70% of the time, the woman is right. Hate to say it, it's just the case. Women's intuition is a real thing. And there's a reason for it. I'm not going to get into it right now. But it is a reality. And men, you got to accept it. However, If you're right in a conversation and you exercise your correctness to tear your husband down, you will infantilize him. You will emasculate him and you will make him a child. And oftentimes I'll counsel women who've been married for 20, 30 years and they're like, my husband's so irresponsible. He can't get things together. Well, maybe it's because you treat him like a kid. 
and you've treated him like a kid, and he's lived down to your expectations of him throughout the course of your marriage. If you want your husband to be a man, try this. Treat him like a man. It's hard to do, especially when he's acting like an idiot. But what do you want? Do you want to be right, or do you want to be married to a man? Because you can. You could build him up. You can make him a man. Or you could tear him down. And you can make him effeminate and useless. And the power kind of does rest with you. Ruth, by doing this, is not saying, Boaz, you are greater than me in all ways. And I know nothing in my little feminine brain. Please lead and guide and protect me with all of your masculine power. That's not what's happening here. She is treating Boaz like a man so that he could become what she wants him to become, what she believes he can become. This is a feminine power. It's a feminine superpower. Women as mothers can bring out what they alone see in the ones that they love. But they can only do it if they discipline themselves in this way. <clears throat> Finally, Ruth 3, verse 15. What does it teach us about romance? Actually, uh, let, let's skip down to Ruth 4. I, I don't have time to go through that one. Let's skip down to Ruth 4, verse 5 through 6. Then Boaz says, and this is at a time where he's negotiating, right? He wants to marry Ruth, but there's someone else in line before him. So he's like, I'm going to marry Ruth. And this is his proposal. So Boaz says, on the day you buy the field, so he's talking to the guy, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. And the close relative said, I can't redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for you yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, what does this teach us about affection and romance? The guy who wants to buy the field, he realizes if I buy the field, it ruins a lot of my lineage. It ruins a lot of my inheritance because half of it's going to go to Ruth now. And I don't want to do that. For Boaz, he chooses to do this. Why did he choose to do this? Why did he choose to ruin his legacy, literally split it in half for the sake of this woman? It's because what it means to be in love is it means to exercise the things that you have in the service of another. The woman exercises her femininity to bring out the masculinity of her husband, and the husband exercises his masculinity to bring out the femininity of his wife. It is, in other words, living a sacrificial life towards the one that you love. This is why marriage has fallen out of the limelight in our modern culture. People don't want to sacrifice anymore. They want to have it all. And what the Bible is telling you is you can't have it all. You can have certain things if you're willing to give up certain other things. But every decision you make has a cost. To be single has a cost and to be married has a cost. What we believe as Christians is that the best, most joyous life is a life in service to the worthiest of sacrifices. I give up who I am. I give up my life in service to the benefit of another. That's what Boaz is saying. I'm giving up my inheritance to Ruth. Now, he made that decision not because we don't know anything about Ruth's physical appearance. Maybe she was very beautiful. We don't know. But we do know about her is that she was incredibly virtuous. The reason why in fairy tales all the women are really beautiful and all the men are really handsome is not because it's teaching you to be shallow. All the modern people who criticize the old fairy tales are like, oh, they're just good-looking people getting married. It's a symbol. I know that we're too dense to understand symbols anymore in this country, but it's a symbol of inner virtue. Their external beauty is a symbol of their inner virtue. Boaz is not predominantly attracted to her looks. He's attracted to her character and vice versa. <clears throat> in more traditional cultures, dating is more about understanding what someone is like internally, not what they're like externally. Dating in our culture seems to be more about understanding external chemistry experienced through sexuality than it is about understanding internal virtue that will be more important for your lifelong goals. 
Oftentimes, people will sleep together before they even know the most basic, trivial things about their partner. Boaz is willing to make this level of sacrifice for Ruth, not because he finds her attractive, but because he finds her virtuous. That's what enabled him to do that. And that brings about the coolest thing about this story. Because it may be like, okay, we've been talking about rom-coms for an hour. Why is that important for me? Romance is eternally valuable because in it, we play out the drama of man's salvation before Christ. There's a reason why in Ephesians 5, Paul says it is a great mystery. But when I speak of a husband and wife, I am really speaking of Christ and his church. Think about this story again. What's happening? A man falls in love with a woman who started out in a state in which she had wealth. She went through a period of destitution, and he redeems her out to be the person that he believes that she is meant to be by buying her property. In Matthew 13, verse 44, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like this. It is like a man who buries a treasure in a field, and for the joy over it, he sells all that he has and purchases the field for the treasure that is within it. What does that mean? Well, I think we know John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God purchased the world. He redeemed the world. Why? Not because he loved the earth, but because he loved the treasure buried in it, us. The price of redeeming his bride was redeeming the world. And that price was giving of his son. Notice, Boaz sacrifices his inheritance to be with Ruth. God sacrifices his inheritance, his son, to be with his people. Marriage and romance play out the drama, the divine drama of God saving his people through our bodies, through our lives. That's why it's important. It's not just kind of important. It's massively important. Your life is supposed to sing the glory of this grand romantic tale, the tale of God and his people. And that's why it's so important to have healthy, beautiful marriages. Because your life becomes the story that narrates the gospel. And it might be the only gospel story that anyone ever reads. When David is passing down the story of his ancestors, he's not just simply passing down a sweet story. He's passing down a divine story that has human actors playing out the roles. And they understood that. That's why it's scripture. Think about this as well. It seems so weird to us that this story would be preserved given the fact that these people didn't do anything amazing. Right? They literally just got married. I mean, they're at the time where literal superheroes are running around. Samson was literally running around at this time, killing thousands of people with a jawbone of a donkey. Why do we care about Ruth and Boaz getting hitched? Samson was a great man, but he failed to be a good man. Boaz was a great man because he was a good man. The most heroic thing you can do is to act out the divine play of God's redemption through your love and redemption of someone else. That's the most heroic thing you can do. If you fail to do that, it doesn't matter how great your actions are outside of it. Samson was a great man, but that dude was terrible with women. And it ruined his legacy as a result. If you want to be a great man, you have to be a good man first. And we got to understand that. And if you want to be a great woman, you got to be a good woman first. This is the most heroic story we have. The fairy stories use mythological elements to emphasize these points, but the foundation is what really matters. Giving of yourself in service of love to another. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we're grateful for this story. I mean, I really do love the book of Ruth. It's so amazing and beautiful. I pray that we could read it and understand it in new light. That we would understand that even though we live in a very different world and culture than what Ruth and Boaz lived in, we could still emulate the ideals that they set out for us. We could learn to live our lives in submission and sacrifice to another, to put our bodies on the line, to put our lives on the line, 
to create a family, to create a marriage that reflects your glory and reflects your beauty. We love you so much, God, and in your name, amen. So now we're going to enter into a time of communion. And uh, when we go into a time of communion, I, was, I always try to think of like a new quote, a new inspiration that we can meditate on as we take of the elements. And I always like to preface this time by saying that communion is a real time where the people of God get to commune with their Lord and Savior. And so if you have not accepted Jesus Christ into your life, if you have not given your life to him and become saved as a result of what he's done, I ask that you let these elements go by. Don't take them. But if you have made that commitment, take the elements and enjoy this time of communion with your Lord. And when you do it, just think on this. This is Luke chapter 22, verse 15 through 20. Jesus said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed on your behalf. When Jesus implemented communion, what he's saying is he's saying his great love for you cost him his life. And we take these elements, we are participating in that sacrifice. We are commemorating it and making it real within our bodies, understanding that Jesus gave himself for us. And we are called, Ephesians chapter 5, it says, just as Jesus gave himself for us, husbands, love your wives in the same way, giving yourself for them. We are to give our bodies in service to those we love, just as our Lord did for us. So as you take the elements, meditate on that truth. Lord, once again, we thank you so much for giving yourself for us, for dying on our behalf, for forgiving us through your blood. Lord, help us to live in 
worship and awe of you, God. Help us to live our lives in just thankfulness towards what you've done for us. And help us to live our lives in emulation of the great love that you showed for us. In your name, amen. All right, guys. Thank you again, as always, for coming. And uh, we're going to hang out for the next 20, 30 minutes. Time of fellowship here. If you got to go, you got to go. Around 11.30, that's when we start picking up. If you want to stay around and help us out, that's cool. Once we start picking up, you don't have to leave. You can just hang out outside if that's what you want to do. Um, but yeah, thank you guys again so much for coming. If I haven't met you yet, please come forward. I'd love to, I'd love to get to know you.